I'm laying here on the pavement, bleeding to death. So this is how it ends. I start wondering where the hell I went wrong. Yeah. The, my mistake was probably taking the case in the first place. Two days ago, there I was, sitting at my desk, and there she was with tears in her eyes, sitting across from me, begging for me to help her. For old times' sake, she'd said. Old times, huh? What were the old times to me nowadays but broken promises and lethal memories? The kind of memories that come to haunt you in the witching hours of the night while you're tossing and turning, as they often did. As I often did. As much as he was a sight for sore eyes, I also knew it meant running into an old friend. Trouble. Every time she walked into the picture, there he was, waltzing in as if he owned the place, getting his grubby little mitts on everything, turning her whole life upside down, and then disappearing into the dead of night, along with her. You wake up one morning only to find a cold side of the bed and a hastily written note stained with tears, always saying the same thing. I'm sorry. She was whistling an awfully sad tune for the beautiful lovebird she was, but you'd think it were an Italian aria from the way I was listening. Oh, I tried to look aloof, but I couldn't feign disinterest. Not with her. I'm a level-headed guy, always breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth and firing with both eyes open. But when I catch a whiff of that perfume or whatever it is about her, the scent of sorrow, I'd like to think it is, I lose it all and caution is mercilessly thrown to the wind. She had burst in saying, Rex, I need your help. But she'd already had me at the stifled sob outside my door. My name's Rex, by the way, Rex Manning, but nobody ever called me by my first name. The only people who ever called me Rex were people who were close to me. Damn close. And seeing as how proximity didn't pay in my line of work, gum shoeing, that didn't make many. So, save for an unfortunate few, I was known to the world as Danger, my middle name. No, really, it is. If you were to give my birth certificate the up and down, it would read Rex Danger Manning. Yes, a cruel joke at my expense, I know, but it's the only thing the folks I never knew ever gave me, so I kept it. The gift that keeps on giving. Ooh. The doll before me, her name, was Mary Standish. We'd met so long ago that we often joked that neither of us remember how or when it happened, but the truth of the matter was it was a day that neither of us could ever forget. It was a Thursday. I was nothing but a fresh face on the force. You couldn't find a cockier thing on two legs if you tried. Short of a rooster, that is. I was supposed to give the third to some number we nailed that night. The only surviving witness to the biggest knockover this town had ever seen. Imagine my surprise when I walked into the room expecting some dead pan palooka and instead found a looker. What are you in for? I asked. Nothing, came the reply. Really? How much nothing? A lot. She may not have been singing like I wanted her to, but her eyes told me everything I needed to know. I think they're going to be what I missed most. I don't even think I ever really knew what they were. Her eyes were like trucks that came out of nowhere and plowed into you. They were eyes no man could say no to. Dangerous. That's what they were. A man could either drown or get lost in that kind of eye, and I knew it. But did I care? I would look into her eyes every morning because I knew it would take me the rest of the day just to find my way back. So we did nothing. All day. Stroll, laugh, talk, joke, stall for more time until I could finally find my way out in the evening after the sun had gone down and I could navigate by starlight. By her light. <laughs> Listen to me, Ja. By listening, you'd say I was pretty out of it. Jingle brain for some red hot kitten with a rap sheet. Well, pretty out of it was right. I was out of everything, determined to keep my nose clean of any messy business. My kind of business. The kind of business based in deception so deeply rooted within half-truths and whole lies that the web it wove could easily ensnare any innocent bystander, including her. In a word, trouble. But if there's any word that could describe trouble, it's incorrigible. You could pick him up, give him the broad rake, throw him out on his ear, and then just when you think he's out for the count, he'd come back at you, swinging. Anyway, after she had come and gone enough times to make me lose count each time, promising to be the last, she was back again, this time not with open arms, but with news. Big news. I'm getting married. There were a million things I wanted to say to that, 
but it was either all or none, so I went with the latter. Boy, talk about some shocking news. It was news enough to knock me for a loop, but that wasn't all she'd had, oh no. Last but not least, she had a huge favor to ask of me. Get her hubby to be out of a jam. Apparently, for the last couple of months, he had been being blackmailed by some hombre who had been in the wrong place at the right time. My job? Find out who, and if possible, silence the goose. Consider it your wedding gift. Damn it. I was like putty in her paws. I should have said no. I know it now, and I knew it then. So why didn't I? Like I said before, her eyes. So, next thing I know, I'm on a rattler to Atlantic City, America's playground. Over the course of the next few hours, she had filled me in on all the details, careful to leave the past out of it, where it belonged. Even though I managed to keep my trap shut, there was a part of me that wanted nothing more than to talk about it. All of it. The rest of me was glad that she was in control of our conversation. Her man's name is Miles Lancaster. He had some dough to it too, about a hundred large, give or take. Mostly take, thanks to our Johnny Do-Wrong. I just sat there, absorbing each and every detail like a dry sponge, careful to commit it all to memory, keeping in mind that the facts were seldom the same going in as they were coming out. Meeting Miles for the first time, I was pleasantly surprised, not to mention relieved, to find that he was all in all the right gi. However, I couldn't help but to shake the sneaky suspicion that he wasn't tipping his mitt all the way. I don't know whether it was the look of worry that wasn't in his eyes or the bullets he wasn't sweating. Something about him just wasn't completely square. After Mary flopped, I decided it was time to catch wise to the part of the story he'd skipped with the dame present. Miles made his way to his own private gin mill and poured himself a snort. What's your poison, Manning? All right, enough bumping gums. Sing. I want to hear the notes you skipped. You're still dizzy with her, aren't you? Say, who's grilling who around here? I shot back coolly, having no good answer to that particular question. Well, I had an answer, just one I didn't care to tell him. Of course you are. You're helping us, aren't you? Frankly, can't say I blame you. Dolls like Mary aren't exactly a dime a dozen. I know, which is why you'd better be shooting straight with her and me, or else be sure to lamb off and hide in a place where no man will be able to find you. Because I will, and when I do, I'll really hide you. Savvy? Relax, Bo. I know you got me doped as a ringer, but I'm telling you now that nothing could be further from the truth. I looked into his eyes, searching for anything I might not be able to trust. <sighs> nothing. I relaxed a little, attention leaving my balled up fists. Listen, I'm sorry for getting so bent out of shape. It's just that when it comes to Mary, the kid's been through a lot. I don't think she could take another wrong key. Forget it. I'd be exactly the same if I were in your shoes. Some cat lousy with cabbage walks into the picture, covers her with glad rags, gives her everything she's ever wanted, except peace of mind. He paused and looked up from his tiger milk. I don't think she would have gotten through with it if you didn't know. I guess you wouldn't feel right. That's the real reason you're here. That and... He heaved a sigh of accepting reluctance before proceeding. I, um, haven't been completely square with Mary. The small knot in my stomach grew. I told her that I don't know who's blackmailing me. I do. It's Raymond Mandela. The name dug an icy shiv into my pump. A beat passed. My throat decided to let me speak again. The first thing out was, Raymond Mandela, huh? Mandela and I went way back, maybe too far back. It was thanks to him that I walked with a slight limp, lead poisoning, courtesy of Mandela himself. i have been tracking him down, realizing that his migration pattern coincided with a traveling circus. Turns out he'd been living under the big top as a trapeze artist for months without anyone suspecting a thing. Except for me. When we came mano a mano, he managed to plug me with three slugs before I finally squeezed off a few. I was lucky enough to have the first two whiz right through me. The third one stuck. Croakers never were able to get it out. They said it was too close to my left kneecap. No biggie. I ain't no Nance. In the end, however, Mandela took it on the lamb, and I haven't seen him since. I uh, think I'll take that drink now, Miles. Stiff hooker of whiskey. Uh, make it two. 
figured, he said, smiling and pouring. You can tell a lot about a fellow from his, uh, drink. Whiskey, it's no nonsense. Straight to business drink. He brought it over and handed it to me. Sensing a question that ought to have been asked, but wasn't, he went on to say, I used to be a bartender, and I know what you're thinking. You, Miles, a bartender, but hey, everybody's got to start somewhere, eh? He took a sip of his, and I took a gulp of mine. Oh, it was good stuff. So what's the dirt Mandel has got on you? He sighed. I said everyone's got to start somewhere, right? Well, sometimes that somewhere is worse than nowhere, if you catch my drift. I nodded. Because at least nowhere doesn't get you thrown in jail. Nowhere doesn't get you thrown in with the wrong crowd. Nowhere doesn't lead you to the wrong dame. Dames. It was starting to make more sense. So what? All this is just so that she don't find out about your dark past? Listen! She thinks I'm different. I'm the first Mr. Right in a long line of Mr. Wrongs. If she finds out that I'm the same mistake she's made in the past... Oh, but you're not. You got out of the biz. You could have stayed on Easy Street, but you winged out on your own to do it all the right way. Very smart enough to see that. Yeah, but the rest of the world isn't. That's the other part of it. See, if Mary finds out, at least I know she'll be willing to listen. I might be able to salvage us, because she still sees me. But out there... He pointed out the window with his free hand, becoming visually upset and displaying real emotion for the first time. All they see is ex-con, ex-bootlegger, ex-money launderer. You're only as good as the worst part of your past. Present and future don't count for anything. Miles realized where he'd taken himself and came back to zero. <laughs> Funny, you'd figure that two to one are pretty good odds. I chuckled. I'd taken bigger gambles on a lot less. So, uh, let me get this straight. You want me to stop Raymond Mandela from costing you your dame, your name, and your riches and fame. He looked up at me, puzzled. Fame? I shrugged. I needed something that rhymed with dame and name. He laughed. Stick with what you do best. Oh, I see Mary's told you about that then. He laughed again. He got up and walked over to shake my hand. Danger? I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I accepted and shook his hand. Call me Rex. Time was of the essence. The next drop was in a day. Today. And Miles wanted me to nail the bastard before then. He couldn't afford to lose any more money, not with a wedding in the works. And so I disappeared in the world I had lived in for the greater part of my life, doing my best to track down Mandela, a feat in and of itself, as people seldom found Mandela. He found them. Being called out by Mandela was like being subpoenaed for jury duty. You hated doing it, but you knew damn well your name was coming out of that hat sooner or later. After spending the entire night playing half of cops and robbers, I decided to call it a day and headed back to my hotel room. Boy, was I in for a treat. I was walking down the hallway when I looked up and who should I see but old Jimmy Halsworth. Uh-oh, I said loud enough for him to hear. Somebody better get the manager. I think I smell a rat. Jimmy was a rat, all right. Rat by nature, personality, and profession. If all you had was a missing part of the equation and a century in your pocket, Jimmy was the guy to see. He had the knack of knowing everything. Well, almost everything. And what he didn't know, he could find out easily enough. Sure, knowing that much can get you into a lot of trouble, but it can get you out of it, too. I started towards him. Danger, thank God, I... The smile of relief on his face changed with a gunshot that rang out into the hallway. I stooped to catch him as he fell to the ground. It was then that I noticed the corner of a dark trench coat disappearing around the corner. I laid Jimmy down as fast as I could and dashed over to peek around. It was too late. Whoever it was had split. The detective in me told me to take it on the heel and tow after the gun. But the human in me told me to take care of the man bleeding to death outside of my hotel room. I managed to convince myself that Jimmy might have some useful information for me and started back to my room. When Jimmy finally came to, he awoke to find himself bandaged in the bathroom. Morning, Mary Sunshine. You have a nice nap? His mitt shot down to his side, only to find he was missing something. He spun around and saw me standing in the doorway. Looking for something? I asked, holding a small Roscoe out towards him. He sighed and cupped his noggin with both flippers. Oh, thank God. I thought I dropped it looking for you. He gratefully took it back. You know there's only one thing worse than losing your heat. Oh yeah, I said, moving to the edge of the bathtub. What's that? Loosing your spare, he said, withdrawing an even more minuscule mate from his 
ankle holster aiming it straight at me. When I didn't even so much as flinch, he looked from me to his rod, then back at me again. He uncocked it and laid it on the open palm of his paw as if weighing it. So what you do, pinch on my shells? What's the matter, don't trust me? I could ask you the same question. I fished around in my pocket for all the lead I nicked. Frankly, I'm surprised you even noticed with a pathetic excuse of a pea shooter like that. I forked them over. Hey, it's not easy for this thing to get any lighter, he said, taking them. So when it does, you notice. He started reloading. What do you carry the damn thing around for anyways? You couldn't kill a fly with it, much less protect yourself. Hey, it's not the size of the counts, it's how you use it. Listen, Jimmy, just because every girly you know tells you that, don't necessarily make it true. Ow, damn it, he said, suddenly feeling a sharp, twinging pain. What, you all right? Yeah, hold on, I think there's something. He felt around his back before fading, removing a shiv and presenting the invisible weapon to me. I believe this belongs to you. I rolled my eyes at the lame joke and started walking away, turning on the shower head on the way out. A cascade awakened, drenching Jimmy. He frantically tried to get out of the tub, only to slip on the wet porcelain. Hey, danger, come on, Bo, this is a nice suit. He finally managed to turn off the water before drowning. Eh, no matter. You'll be buying me a new one when you find out the dope I got for you. Oh, what do you have for me? Better be bona fide. Danger, you know me. My tips are backed by a guarantee of authenticity. Where are the towels around here? One flew in and hit him square in the mug. Thanks. He started drying himself off. Anyway, as I was saying, what I have for you ain't gonna come cheap. How much, I asked, fixing myself a drink. He stuck his head out of the loo. You might want to pour yourself another one of those. Hell, pour me one. He went back to drying himself. Half a large. I nearly gagged at my court. Half a grand? He grinned. Yep. We're talking five C's. He nodded. What the hell could you know that's worth that much jack? He emerged from the head and waltzed over to where I was. A little something about one Miles Lancaster, currently engaged to one Mary Standish. I nearly gagged again. <laughs> I poured him a drink and slid it towards him. All right, you've earned it. How did you know I was asking about Miles? <laughs> I'm Jimmy the Rat Danger, he answered, as if that explained everything. The real question is, how didn't I know sooner? Of all the people I should have been keeping tabs on, Mary? I mean, Jesus H. Christ, Danger, though Dame's always in Dutch. Yeah, I know. But what the hell was I supposed to do? Say no? It's one last favor, Jimmy. If you're not careful, it could be your very last. This rabbit hole goes a hell of a lot deeper than you know. I learned the hard way. He placed a mitt on the bandages. You know, you're lucky. Looks like the pill pushed clean through. No traffic with nothing. It still hurt? A piece of lead penetrated my dorsal muscles, pierced through my body, and exited out the other end through my abdominal wall. What do you think? All right, sorry. No need to get snooty. I'm sorry, it's just that, well, I'm afraid I have some rather devastating news. What? You promise you won't shoot the messenger? I can promise that I will shoot you if you don't tell me. Spill. He sighed. Somebody knocked off Dan Boyle. This got my attention. What? Damn it, I wanted to ice him. I know, I'm sorry. I sat down into a nice comfortable chair which offered very little comfort. In pursuit of Mandela last year, I happened across Danny Boyle, wanted in several states for embezzlement. So I clamped the bracelets on him, but the slippery snake managed to cop the sneak once I handed him over to the proper authorities. What happened? Did it have anything to do with my leg? Harlem Sunset, and it's hard to say, he said, pretending to struggle with the words. Without the whole five yards, he extended an empty paw. Mary and Joseph, I beefed. Come on, Jimmy, we've known each other for how many years now? Can't I get a discounted rate or something? He looked at me, astounded. 500 berries is the discounted rate. You think I charge that little for just anybody now, do you? No way, Jose. This price is reserved for close and personal friends of Jimmy the Rat. Jeez, with friends like you, who needs enemy? Yeah, I know, just fork over the dough. I reached into my skin and pulled out a couple centuries. Tell you what, here's... 250. You'll get the rest when I hear the rest. Fair enough, he said, shrugging. He took his glass and sat down in the other chair opposite mine. So, you want the abridged version or the whole fairy tale? For a portrait of Madison, I'd better get the whole damn story. Start spilling. 
15 years ago, our Miles Lancaster stumbles into a bar. Uh, wait a minute, what about Danny? Hold on, he fits into the picture later. I decided to be patient for once in my life and listen. Anyway, as I was saying, 15 years ago, our Miles Lancaster stumbles into a bar owned by Daryl Hammett in need of a stiff drink and an ear to bend. He starts singing about some dream business he would start, one that would keep him on the road and earn him enough dough to keep anyone happy. If only he had the capital means. Daryl, being the sympathetic or gullible, as I like to call him, type, agrees to go into business with him. So Daryl the bartender closes down the joint, his only possession in the world, and goes into cahoots with Mr. Lancaster. One day, Daryl takes to the air. Poof, he's gone. Miles becomes the sole proprietor of their little lay, and nobody's seen Daryl since. Now, word has it that there was an invisible hand in the game, Danny Boyle. You're saying Miles and Danny grifted Daryl before bumping him off and fifteeing the cush? And now years later, Miles has done the same to Danny? But why? Uh, did Danny want more after tossing all his cabbage to the wind? Hey, I'm just a rat. You're the private dick. I stepped into the study, only to find that he wasn't there. I drew my cannon and called out, Miles, I'm out here on the terrace. I stepped outside to be greeted by a cool breeze and Miles leaning against the railing. It's beautiful, isn't it? He asked. You think that's a sight? You should turn around. Miles turned around. I half expected him to have his own bean shooter drawn. He didn't. What's that for? You've been lying to me, Miles. I don't know what you're... Cool it. You've been lying to me from the start. You didn't think I'd find out the real reason you were being blackmailed? I told you I'm being blackmailed because of who I used to be. Then what's that? A grafter? A grafter who gypped Daryl Hammett before rubbing him and his partner out? Miles was silent for a moment. Y you know about Daryl? You mean the guy you flim-flammed out of his entire life savings before making sure he bought the big one? Yeah, I know about him. I never... Uh, no, I wasn't the one who... You're Mary's beau, so I'm going to give you one last chance to come clean. You do, and I'll turn you in. You don't. Then the way I see it, you've lost the right to breathe the same air as me. I cocked my Roscoe. You got until the count of three, Miles. One. Miles closed his eyes, trying to catch his breath. Come on, say something. Two. A tear escaped into the nippy night. Anything, goddammit. Three. I don't want to blow you away, Miles, but I swear to God I will. If not for my own sake, then Mary's. Say hello to Daryl for me. The next thing out of Miles' trap exploded like a round out of a Roddy. Oh, Rex, I swear to God, I didn't kill Daryl Hammett. I'm Daryl. There were only two times in my life that I had been speechless. That is, completely unable to speak. The first was from the moment I was born until the age of 18 months. The second was that moment. Miles, or Daryl, sighed. And I didn't kill Miles either, or Danny for that matter. Night before, we're supposed to close a big deal. He lambs off with all our cabbage, and I never hear from him again. Nah, I don't know what to do, but I couldn't do nothing. I mean, it's not like I go back to bartending. Everything I had, I put into this. So I just went on with business. Next morning, I show up, and they think I'm Miles, and I'm not sure what possessed me to do it, but I said yes. I went along with it. I've been Miles ever since. There were hundreds of things I should have asked. But the first thing out of my yap was... Does Mary know? Her? Oh, God, no. I mean, I've thought about telling her on several occasions, like right after I proposed, but then she looked at me with those eyes of hers, and I couldn't. I chuckled. It's nice to know that some things never change. Can we talk about this inside? I replaced my rod in its holster. Yeah, sure. I'll let him step through the door first. Where is Mary, anyway? Upstairs. Is it safe to talk, then? Yeah, she's in our room, probably chinning away on the blower. He smiled at the thought of her. I recognized that smile. I used to see it in the mirror every day. Miles took a seat and I followed suit. Back to business. So, how did Mandela find out? I asked. Honestly, I haven't the foggiest. That's part of why I hired you. Right, right, of course. I went to thinking. How were Mandela and Boyle connected? I was thinking about when and where I nabbed Boyle when I heard the Amici. I looked to Miles. He wasn't moving. Well, aren't you going to get that? It's him. You mean? Miles nodded. I started to reach for it when Miles stopped me. He got up and walked over. Closing his eyes and taking a deep breath, he picked up the receiver. Hello? 
After a moment, he hung up and looked to me. Five large, Pier 6, the old fish-cutting factory, 11.30, come alone. He stood there for a moment, trying to cope with the fact that this would probably never end. The hell you're going alone, he exhaled. <laughs> and what would you do? You hired me to make this right, and that's what I'm going to do. All we need is a plan. Well, there's no time for that. Then I'll just have to think on my feet. I walked around the outside of the rusted exterior, trying to find a way up. I was about to go to plan B when I saw a set of stairs I wouldn't trust a chimp to climb. But, desperate times. I cautiously started my way up, being sure to test each rung before I placed my entire weight on it, knowing full well that each one could be my last. I would have knelt and thanked God properly when I reached the roof, but there was no time for formalities. Besides, if I wasn't careful, I'd be able to thank him in person real soon. I found a sky hatch used for ventilation and prayed it wouldn't squeak when I opened it. It didn't. One more thing to add to my thank list. I lowered myself onto the catwalk, rigged near the ceiling of the place, and began to stealthily find a good vantage point where I could keep an eye on things. It would be hard. It was dark. Damn dark. I came to a clearing where I had a completely unobstructed view of practically the whole joint. Miles stood in the middle of the warehouse floor, more nervous than a kid on his first day at a new school. A new school would be a picnic compared to what we were about to try. Do you have the money? A voice boomed out, echoing off the walls. My eyes peered into the darkness, trying to locate the origin of the voice. Damn, this guy was smart. Miles swallowed the knot in his throat. Yes. He held up a keister. A figure stepped out of the darkness. It was Mandela, all right. Set it on the ground and slide it over here. Miles did as he was told. His roaming eyes told me that he was looking for me, hoping I had not abandoned him. I told him to stop in my mind, lest he wanted to give me away. He didn't hear me. Mandela looked up from the case to Miles. You're short one large. Please, that's all I have right now. I'll give it to you next month, uh, plus interest. I didn't ask for interest. I asked for five grand. He drew a cannon and cocked it. Uh, honey, no. Mary? I thought I told you to come. Mandela would have said alone but I got the drop on him. Literally. Rule of gumshoe. At the first sign of trouble, move. Doesn't have to be planned, doesn't have to be in the right direction, just as long as you don't freeze. We hit the ground hard, and I heard his heat skid off into the darkness. Before I knew it, he was back up on his feet and taking a Mickey Finn. I heard him scooping up his piece without adjusting his pace, and I took after him. I noticed that Miles and Mary were nowhere in sight. Good. I stopped running for a second trying to listen to which way the footsteps were running, but it was no good. The echoes kept on coming from every which way around me. They stopped. I thought it best to bide my time until he gave himself away. Sooner or later, I'd find out where he was hiding. A small burst of light from the catwalk above me was my only clue to roll and fire back. A grunt responded, followed by the clatter of a rod dropping. Then nothing. I was pretty sure he'd bit the big one, but I wanted to be completely sure. I was starting my way up the ladder when I heard the flutter of a fast-falling flogger, truncated by a bone-breaking thud. I made my way back down and over to Ray's lifeless body, a pile of clothes and flesh on the floor in no particular order or condition. That had to hurt. After taking a minute to memorize the moment, I knelt down next to him and moved in to within an inch of his face and waited. Nothing. Can't say it was a pleasure, Ray. I got up and began limping away, feeling very dissatisfied and not at all at ease. My uneasiness breezed the instant I saw Mary emerge from the corner she was hiding behind, safe and sound. Is it over? Is it finally over? She asked. I didn't get the chance to nod because right at that moment I noticed a familiar figure rising off the floor and drawing a gun off of the reflection in the window. Mary, down! was all I had the chance to say as I jerked around, dove in front of her, and pulled the trigger. Too late. I caught a slug in my gut right as I drilled him in the left leg just above the kneecap. Now we're even. He screamed for a moment. You're gonna regret that danger! Never. He angled his gat at a lethal level and squeezed the trigger. Click. I smirked before spitting another one out of the chamber and square into his throat. In those moments... I felt no pain. I was waiting too intently for a sound I had longed to hear for far too long. After several moments, I heard it. 
Raymond Mandela, heaving his last breath, choking through his own blood. I finally relaxed and let my conch hit the cold ground. So that's it, my last case. Can't really complain, unless I took someone out with me. She rushes forward to hold me. Oh, Rex, she sobs, taking me into her arms. I can feel myself slowly slipping. No one is strong enough to wrestle with death for very long. A thought crosses my mind. Mary, there's something you should know. Miles isn't. It's now that I notice him walking up behind Mary with a look in his eyes, hoping that I wouldn't have had to come to this, but knowing it should. He isn't a bad guy, I finish. Not as bad as I'd hoped, at least. I manage a smile and look up to see Miles, with a chuckle on his face and gratitude in his eyes. He gets down on his knees to help me up. Come on, let's get you to a hospital. <laughs> Don't bother, I reply. I've near death enough times now to know when there's no coming back. He nods, knowing I'm right. Mary isn't taking the news well. It crosses my mind to say, take good care of her, but <laughs> something told me he would. She clutches my hand in my last few moments as if it were my very soul, as if to prevent me from slipping into the unknown oblivion we can only define as the big sleep. I can hear her sobbing, and it echoes my mind. That's the last thing I ever hear. I'm sorry, she says. Don't be. It was nothing. Thank you.